Good morning, and welcome to our UCW service on this Sunday, April 24th, 2022. Welcome to all of you in our sanctuary today, and welcome to all of you in Zoom land. You bless us with your presence. Just a few announcements and reminders. The family of Lawrence Robotham will hold a visitation in loving memory of their husband and father. The visitation will be held on Saturday, April 30th, from 2 to 4 p.m. in the Lower Church Hall. This will be a lovely time to gather and show support to Bev and the family. Missionary Service is working with Elise Cook, one of our most youth in Kelvin Park Public School, to collect toiletries for the homeless. Please bring your toiletry items to the church. Or call the church to let us know that you'd like someone to do a porch pickup and we will pick up the items at your home. <coughs> the church garage sale will be held on Saturday, May 14th. Lauren and Lauren is looking for volunteers to help, set up on Friday, May 13th, and to help on the day of the garage sale. I think there's lists out in um, the foyer. If you have treasures to donate, call Lauren and Lauren or Tom Kurt to arrange a pickup. Their phone numbers are in tidies. Lorna says they also need bags for purchases. She also wanted me to tell you that they have been selling items on Facebook Marketplace and close to $500 has already been raised. And a reminder about fun script shopping carts. There are lists on the Welcome Center Island of retailers for whom fun script cards can be purchased. You can order shopping cards online by phoning Sharon Van List. And either way, they will be delivered to your door. We encourage you to read tidings. There's so much information there for you. This is the life and work of Edith Franklin United Church. On Sunday, we gather to worship. Let us worship God. UCW service. It's a blessing to have our UCW provide leadership for us this morning. I'm just stepping in for a quick minute. I'm sad to announce this morning the death of one of our classics, Eric Van Dalen. Eric died yesterday at Kingston General Hospital. He had a bad fall on Easter weekend, which took him to hospital by ambulance, and he's been there for the weekend. Died peacefully in his sleep yesterday morning. Eric turned 92 just recently on April the 18th. Uh, no arrangements have been made yet at this time, but I ask you to keep Eric's family in your prayers. And secondly, this morning, I want to share with you, Heinz Becker arrived at church this morning to work diligently with our tech team, as he always does, and then received a call from Leola. And Leola Becker's mom has just passed away this morning at her long-term care facility in Napanee. Her name is Annie Falk, and Annie's home church is in Niagara-on-the-Lake. And so any service and burial will take place there, but we ask you to hold Leola and Heinz and all of Annie's family in your prayers. So as we gather here for worship this morning, to be blessed by the UCW, for the women who have faithfully held at this church and so many across the country, uh, we ask that you would continue to lift up in light and in love those who live, those who have died, and those who are lived to eternal rest in heaven. We light this candle this morning for any fault and for Eric Van Dalen. We gather here in the light of faith, the light of hope, the light of love. We light this candle of faith. May we have faith that our loving God will guide us through adversity. May we never lose hope that the power of love will bring peace to each of us and peace to our world. 
with all God's people, and for all God's people, we say, Amen. I want to share with you a very beautiful reading from Mother Teresa. May today be peace within. May you trust your highest power that you are exactly where you were meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith. May you use those gifts that you have received and pass on the love that has been given to you. May you be content knowing that you are a child of God. Let this presence settle into your bones and allow your soul the freedom to sing, dance, praise, and love. It is there for each and every one of you. Amen. Good morning. On this ECW Sunday, we gather to worship God here on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We gather with a heightened sense of awareness of the adversity faced by countless Indigenous women who have lived on this land from time immortal. We commit to acknowledging our truths of racism and colonization in the church and beyond. And we commit to living out the work of reconciliation by recognizing and celebrating all women's voices, both sung and unsung, heard and not heard. Women's groups have been meeting for a variety of reasons throughout the United Church since its formation in 1925. In 1962, the UCW, the United Church Women, was created as the successor to the Women's Missionary Society, the WMS, and the Women's Association, the WA. This year, March 2022, marks the 60th anniversary of the creation of the UCW. With many thanks to Craig Pettis, who has put together a 17-minute slideshow of pictures of UCW events and women over the 60 years. Uh, we had them rolling before the service, but if you didn't get a chance to see them, they are going to be rolling immediately after the service for you to take a peek at. The purpose of the UCW is to unite all women of the congregation for the total mission of the church and provide a medium through which we may express our loyalty and devotion to Jesus Christ in Christian um, witness, study, service, and fellowship. The UCW at Edith Rankin is going to mark this remarkable benchmark by celebrating our 60th anniversary on Wednesday, June the 22nd with a party in the lower hall that can spread out onto the lawn. We are inviting all past and present UCW members to attend, so we hope many of you present here today and those of you at home watching virtually will plan on attending. At that event, we plan to honour the women in our congregation who are charter members. Please help us spread the word, and if you have any questions about this event, please connect with Cheryl Baker. In addition to this celebration, we are intentionally transitioning our UCW groups to ministerial or congregational units that will look very much like the traditional UCW unit, but not be under the UCW umbrella. Please watch for more information about these new groups. Reverend Michelle will give a formal recognition of this transition at the worship service on June 6th. After this morning's worship service, we invite everyone to join us in the Welcome Center for coffee, muffins, and conversation, and to get a chance to speak personally with our guest preacher, Reverend Jean Brown. If you are a visitor and have not done so already, please fill out our guest book at the back or uh, uh, fill in a pew card. Also, we encourage you to take a blue mug. I'm not sure if it's got a blue sticker, but we did have a little bit of blue on it. Uh, during our morning, or during our coffee. We want to be able to identify you and welcome you to Edith Rankin Memorial United Church. As you are able and feel comfortable, please stand and join together in the singing of our opening hymn, sung at the inaugural UCW service in 1962, How Firm a Foundation.
So whether you are at home or in this sanctuary, you are prepared to worship the giver of life. Ever majesty, holy one, may we be renewed so that we participate in this service, learning from the first disciples the way of Jesus, our guide for life. Let us pray. As we enter into worship, help us, God, to seek your guidance so that the works of our hands will be acceptable in your sight for the advancement of your kingdom in this community, in this country, and throughout the world. Amen.
and put on the screen with accompanying tape recording of children explaining their hardworking story fashion. Uh, her creativity was ahead of the computer times of today. Jean loved going to church and in her younger years felt called to ministry. However, it was not until she worshipped in a church with female clergy and experienced that role model that she responded to God's call graduating from Queen's Theological College in 1990, the year she turned 40. Her first pastoral charge was to Loring in Golden Valley, where after two years she sought a post closer to Kingston and family. She served seven years in the United Churches of Arden, Henderson, and Mountain Grove, where she met her husband, Alan Guernsey, and they were married in 1999. Uh, Jean served in Yarker in Moscow for two years and then moved to a more part-time ministry doing public supply, filling in for maternity leaves and taking short and long-term contracts, which then resulted in a seven-year part-time call to ministry at Madoff United Church, where she retired for the first time January 31st in 2011. She then spent until 2020 doing public supply and maternity leaves in the area, including a five-year call to ministry at Charlotte Lake and Parham United Church when she retired fully and finally, she says, uh, finally, uh, November 15, 2020. She's currently a voluntary associate minister at Selby United Church with Reverend Mike Putnam and another voluntary associate minister, the Reverend Ed McKay. Jean enjoys being retired and spending time with his wife, Alan Bernsey, who is a rock, her anchor, and constant comfort. Welcome, Jean and Alan, to be the Franklin Memorial United Church. Well, thank you very much. That's quite an introduction. My goodness sakes. I, and it's true, I have fully and finally retired, and uh, although I am here today to help out. And I really want to thank uh, my sister for her kind introduction, and all the UCW and Handbell Choir people for your caring and, and your sharing and your fantastic music here that you have. Also, my brother-in-law, Craig, is a saint. He gets things organized here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he's fantastic on the audiovisual, as are your whole tech team. And haven't these folks been so precious to us in COVID times? We never thought about putting anything on a screen, at least where we served out in the country. And um, now we depend so fully on our technical team. So we really want to thank them so much for their technical support. And of course, my spouse, Alan, who was ever so pleased when I did retire fully and finally, because he would come to every service, and sometimes I preach two times on a Sunday, or sometimes three, so you can only imagine how many times he had to listen to it all. So I want to thank him for being here with us today, and of course, your clergy, Reverend Michelle Down and her spouse, Joyce, thank you so much. And your wonderful music ministry with Kim Barney, we've enjoyed your music. Um, we weren't really able to get inside any churches for so very long during COVID. So to be able to enjoy it all on the screen has been a real tribute to God. So I'd like to put this time right now into God's hands. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this day and for this in-person worship which we offer to your glory. Speak through my faltering words and ideas today, and be for me an anchor of hope. Empower us all today, we pray, and be strength for us, our musical and our spiritual teams here, and our whole world, in the name of the one who gives us strength. Amen. Well, my sister started out talking about the Samson slideshow that we did, and that one sure was about 1965, a long time ago, and yet it was, as she said, it was very cutting edge in that we explained the story of Samson, and, and the younger worshippers got into it. Oh, Samson, he was strong, and they were drawing pictures of this strong and mighty Samson, and all oh, how God guided him, and what it meant to be strong, and what it meant to be weak, and... You know, as I look back on it all now, I think, you know, it went on for several months. It took a long time to get all that going. And uh, the, the younger worshippers made these drawings, and we took pictures of them. And then they were sent away to make slides, and then they came back. And then we used some tape recorder. I'm sure it was some reel-to-reel -reel type thing grinding around and around. I think it's funny now. I mean, at the time, that was very exciting. It was a true experience, and it captured for us a very special moment in time. 
And I know that you have so very many creative people here who do the similar, same kinds of things. What's amazing to me is that what took us three or four months to do can actually be done in three minutes. We could have something up here on the screen in two minutes or three minutes. So it's just an example of how far we've come. Also, we used to show a lot of photos. Whenever we did any kind of a project at our church, we'd put up photos of it, or we'd carry photos around with us. And so photos are another thing that have kind of diminished, aren't as popular anymore. But today, I'm going to sort of make this like a picture show. We're going to make a look at two distinct photographs of the church based on the Easter story and based on the scripture today. So we'll be looking at two snapshots at, of the church. One is just after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that the way we celebrated it last week in our church services and how wonderful Easter celebrations were. We watched it on the screen at home and then all across Canada, folks were celebrating Easter so fantastically. What a moving tribute it was, such special music, you know. I know that my Redeemer liveth, sung so convincingly and so spectacularly here in this church. There was music, there was delight, there was excitement, there was hope. Handbells and special music. So, so very wonderful. So that's one picture that we're going to look at today. That's our picture today of Easter and of the church. But the picture that was read, that was shown to us today in the scriptures, read by Bonnie, gives us an entirely different picture of Easter. And yet, that really is the very first time that the followers have got together since the death and resurrection of Jesus. So one would sort of think that, you know, there'd be some kind of excitement, some kind of, it'd be a big celebration like what we had here. In fact, this picture of the, the, of the church, and it is a church, sort of like a church service, the first followers gathering together, we see them, they are frightened, they are huddled together, they are hiding behind locked doors. Uh, Jesus comes through the door and, and starts to talk to them, and one of them, Thomas, says, well, gee, I think I need a little bit of proof. Can you show me something here? And, um, you know, that's quite a contrast between what's, what's, how we celebrate Easter now and how that first Easter celebration was. And that brings us to the theme of our service today, which is what happens when things don't go as planned and we are a church in adversity. So things hadn't gone as planned, <coughs> excuse me, for those first followers and they were hiding away, and they were frightened. And that's how they celebrated. So the theme of our service is today, what happens in the face of adversity and fear? When Jesus sort of comes through those locked doors and, uh, and, and confronts them and, and talks to them. So we're getting a little different snapshot of the church today. If you're looking for an image of what that might look like, if you use this stage or this worship area as an example, last week on Easter Sunday, we got the full frontal view of Easter. We, we got all the excitement. We got all of the, the joy. We got all of the claiming, yes, I know that my Redeemer lives. That's the frontal view that we got last week. This week in our scriptures, we get the backstage view of what's going on or how it all took, how it all happened. And behind every front stage view, there's a lot of lost props and script changes and well-presented plans that just go completely awry. And so this is what has happened. We get a backstage view of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ today as they are behind locked doors. Sometimes we lock the doors of our minds and we seal off more and more rooms in our heart to prevent our true selves from being discovered. I would say that today in the scriptures, we saw the true selves of those followers as they were very much afraid and as they were very much hiding away. But at the center of the gospel and the center of the Christian message is always this assertion or this proclamation that Jesus Christ comes looking for us 
and he comes looking for his followers behind the locked doors, and he comes in and he says, peace be with you, you are forgiven, and you are free. So at the center of the gospel is always this proclamation, Jesus Christ comes looking for us, and that's what he does. He says, peace be with you, you are free. The word for forgiveness in Greek can be translated as to, as to be freed. So at the center of our lives is this sense that Jesus Christ, through the gospel, gives us freedom. So what he says to these followers, when you think of it, is really quite remarkable. Very remarkable what he says. Given the circumstances, we might have thought that he would come in and say, well, shame on you guys, you know, I sent you out into the world. I didn't send you into a locked closet. You know, what's wrong? He doesn't say that. Or perhaps he might say, well, you know, maybe I better take over here. I, you know, I don't, I don't think you've kind of got it figured out yet. But he doesn't do that. He gives them sort of a strange set of words. Peace be with you. Receive the Holy Spirit. You are forgiven. To the first followers, to the readers of the Gospel of John when it was written some years later, they would have understood, understood these words as being very symbolic. Peace be with you comes straight from the liturgy. Um, we often say that on Sundays, may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. We're not going to do this. Sometimes people run around and wish one another the peace of Christ, and all, you know, which is kind of exciting in some ways. So peace be with you comes straight from the liturgy. He shows them his hands and his side, which is a reference to communion, you know, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ poured out for you. And the breathing of the Holy Spirit comes from the idea of the Pentecost experience, uh, which is receiving this sense and the ideas and the ideals of Jesus Christ so that we can go out and offer service. So the, the risen Christ always comes into the locked doors of our minds and the locked doors of our hearts, and he always calls us out into a life of service. And this huddled little group of followers did go forward into a life of service after they kind of got empowered. They did go out into a life of service and they did carry the gospel message, they did carry the message of Jesus Christ and we are the result of that today, with the formation of churches, with the formation of our, our front stage view of Easter and the way we celebrate Easter now. And so these followers did stride boldly into the world and they were empowered by the Spirit of God. And, uh, and you might say that they were able to go forward with God's help, even though their plans have changed. And many scholars have written about this idea but what happens when things don't go as we had planned? And one scholar named Wallace Hamilton has said, every person's life is a diary in which he or she means to write one story, but is forced to write another one. So our lives are like a diary where um, we might have one story in mind, but something comes along, the unexpected, and we're forced to write another story. The scriptures are full of those kinds of stories, of people whose lives were changed, people whose course in life was altered, but they went forward. Like the, our scripture today, the life of those followers, first followers was altered, but they did go forward with God's help. The Apostle Paul wanted to go to Spain to start a Christian church there, but instead he was thrown into prison in, in, um, in Rome. The risen Christ keeps entering our lives and helps us to keep going. So a person who comes to my mind in my life as someone who, whose life was dra uh, drastically altered is someone that my sister Ruth was talking about or gave, gave a little talk about at a UCW meeting. And that person is Ethel Mulvaney. And uh, a scholar named Suzanne Evans has written a book about her. And I'm sure that some of you have heard a little bit about her life. Um, she's, really, she's not that well known particularly. And yet, she was a, a great role model to me. Ethel Mulvaney from my home at Manitoulin Island was born in 1904. She died in 1992. So I was sort of like, well, I grew up with her. Um, she was a returned veteran from the World War. 
and I'm a baby boomer, so the, the war is part of my life. And, but Ethel fought an entirely different war than did my dad, who was a returned veteran. My dad fought for the liberation of Holland, and we went to Holland to see where, where he fought and where he helped to liberate the people, and that was his life. Ethel Mulvaney fought an entirely different war. She was a prisoner of war in the, in the Shanghai prison. It wasn't the life that she had planned. She was young. She was newly married. She thought her life was going in one direction. She ended up, she and her husband ended up being captured, and she ended up in a prison in Shanghai where she was starved and treated terribly and ended up coming out weighing only 80 pounds, and she could barely walk. So you can imagine, here's this woman in our little village, you know, and here's me, a teenager, here's all of us just going about our daily lives, and every so often, my mom would come across Ethel Mulvaney, you know, at church. Sometimes she would start to cry. The amazing thing is, nobody ever said, what are you crying about? You know, everybody, you know, just, oh, Ethel was crying. Ethel would cry at church. Sometimes she'd get worked up about something. Other times she, she would do things that were very different. She was eccentric. She was forced to be reckoned with. And as I say, her, her life has been, has been captured in this book. But in, she was very brave because in 1965, when I was 15, she came to our young people's group to talk to us. And she was telling us about her life in this prison. Well, my word, I just had never heard anything like that before, really. And it was way beyond me, but it always stuck with me. Here was someone whose life changed drastically, and yet she kept going. For instance, she showed us her Bible. She had this red, little red Bible. Oh, it was all in disarray. There was even teeth marks on the cover of it, and the spine of it was off. And, and she showed us this Bible, and she said, you know, I used to, um, it was held together with glue, and she took the spine off of it and sucked on the glue to give herself some, some nourishment. She said she felt like eating the pages, but she couldn't possibly eat the pages because she needed to be nourished by God. Well, I mean, this was way beyond anything that we had ever heard before. It was truly fascinating. One of the people who influenced my life toward ministry, um, she did go on, out of all of that, to, to be a, a marvelous presence. She founded the Treasure Van, which was a, a sort of a worldwide type of a, a, a place for vendors to sell and for their products and for awareness to be raised and for the, pro, uh, the projects. The money was used for good. But the message that she gave to us, her final words to us that day was, uh, we, we asked her what, what, what she suggest, or what, what did she have to leave with us. Her final message was, don't hate anybody, she said. I came to the conclusion that I couldn't hate the people that, were, that had us imprisoned in this prison. I couldn't hate the guards. I couldn't hate anybody. Don't hate anybody, she says. Just show them that God is love, no matter what happens. Show people that God is love and keep going no matter what happens. So that is um, what what I have done. I, I also remember too that she told us he even negotiated to organize an Easter sunrise service in this prison. And I think it took her two or three, oh, it took her a very long time to talk about it, to get that going. So she was certainly an example of what we can do when things don't go as planned. We can pray, pause, think, and act, and, and turn to God and, and realize that we do have a risen Savior. Um, now, many times in my life, uh, straight, you know, things happen, and we, I think we have to remember these words, think, pause, pray, and act. For instance, when COVID uh, came into our little communities and I was serving in Charlotte Lake, I guess I, don't, I must have been too aware of what was going on or what was about to happen, but I didn't come into church one Sunday and the volunteers were there and they said for announcements, they said well, they were getting ready and you know, we, our churches were going to be closing down and I don't know what all was going to happen and they were opening windows and, and saying all kinds of things and just so very calmly and so matter-of-factly and 
Oh, it was too much for me. I put my head down in the pulpit and started to cry. Oh, dear. You know, I thought, what will we do? And so they said, now Reverend Brown here, we'll talk a little more, and then Reverend Brown will say a prayer for us. You know? So I was like, oh, dear, let's pray. Yes. Somebody pray for me. Well, what came to my mind was uh, a song that, uh, that, uh, that came to my mind. In, the song is called, In Times Like These We Need a Savior. In Times Like These We Need an Anchor. In Times Like These We Need a Bible. Very ancient, old, old song. That song came to me and I thought, well, yeah, we need a Savior, I'll tell you. This is not the, the way we had planned our march in Charlotte Lake and in Parham. And I don't know why, I didn't know anything about it, but anyway, there I was. So they were talking so wonderfully and so fantastically. And I um, told them about this song in times like these, how my parents had been in the Bahamas in the 60s with another couple, and they were at a market, and uh, the people at the market were singing in times like these, and my parents and the other couple got up and started to sing the song with them. Times like these, you need a savior. Times like these, you need a Bible. So I told them that, and I said, these are the times now. And then I based my prayer on that song. Well, I'd like to close the sermon with a prayer based on that song, and then my great niece, Olivia, will be coming up to... Uh, to sing that song for us today. I, I don't know if you know it, it's a very, very ancient old song, but it is a wonderful song. So let's be in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that we have a savior. We thank you that you are our anchor. And we thank you for the Bible and for all that is written in us. We pray that you would continue to speak to us through a ministry of music, that you would Anchor us to Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. this morning, the choir and the handbells, the gift of service and giving from so many of you, 
and today especially the United Church women. Their purpose has been demonstrated through guest speakers who educate and motivate, a working library, artisan bazaars, mostly apples, classics birthday party, cookie walk, meat pie making, local charity support, fair trade products and mission and service, to name just a few. What a blessing these women have been for over 60 years. Thank you. Often, UCW involvement was a family affair, and daughters carried on in the tradition of mothers and grandmothers. One such example is Reverend Jean Brown, our special guest speaker today. Please come forward, Jean. We know from a reliable source that you have a favorite pop star. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Following this theme, we would like to present you with a token of our gratitude made by Ann Dixon and a card made by Judy Bryant. Me all shook up. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. Thank you. Well, that's so fantastic. Wow. This church really rocks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, more Elvis. Oh, so oh, it's too bad the church service is coming to an end. Another person who has blessed us with her devotion to our library is Joan Martin. Joan, are you? Please come up, Joan. <laughs> Can you come up to the front? <laughs> She's making her way there. No, you can stay right there. That's perfect. The library started in 1978 under the umbrella of the UCW. And Joan has willingly been our library convener since 1990. More recently under the congregation and she has some very reliable help. For the gift of your service, Joan, the congregation is presenting you with this plaque to hang on the library door. <laughs> Thank you so much. To all of you who support our church, with PAR, we are so thankful. For those of you who would like to give an offering today, there are plates at the back of the sanctuary. And now, would you please stand as you are able for the singing of the offering. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, hear the prayers of thy people on this fine spring morning down by the bay where we celebrate the United Church women <clears throat> of this church, their talents and their wisdom. We remember the generation of women who've gone before us, sharing their wisdom and love. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you. My own peace I leave with you. We pray today 
for the people of Ukraine, that peace and harmony be restored, and that all may benefit from the richness of resources which our Creator has bestowed on the country. Lord, inspire all those who lead and serve in this church. May they know your guidance and your direction. Show us to serve one another, to offer our love, our care, and support. Inspire our leaders, our teachers, our doctors, our nurses, our social workers, and counselors to bring hope in all situations. Comfort those who are grieving right now. Help them see the light of heaven. Embrace those in pain and suffering. May they feel your closeness. Watch over the lonely and the isolated. Help them see the light of heaven. Embrace those in pain and suffering. May they feel your closeness. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we even ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not or in blindness or cannot ask for, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the prayer our Father taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into at the foot of Wolf Island. At that time, she had a short poem from a local school project, published in the Whig Standard. After she married and settled in Collins Bay, she started writing skits for her friends in Unit 7 of the UCW. Then, the general meetings, the choir, arrivals and departures, and anything else from her church family that could benefit from her creative talent. She was a poet, she was an author, she was a director of plays, she was a singer, and she was an actress. She loved her church, her church friends, and she loved to write. Please join us in the next hymn, The Beauty of Jesus. It's written at the top. Thank you. Thank you. 